Distinguished colleagues, it's um, very good to be here and a pleasure to be able to um, present to you a case study. Um, the theme of this session is theory from theory to practice. And this is a case of practice informed theory being applied to public policy. It is basically evidence based policy which should be very robust. And it was undertaken and is being undertaken by a UK NGO based in Manchester, uh, which operates on a local, national, and global scale. Um, and that NGO is the Foundation for Science, Technology, and Civilization. So how did our journey into balance, balanced and in inclusive education start? How did the adventure start? Well, it was with things like this. Popular books on the history of science, showing two-page spreads like this, um, where it looks as if there are chunks of pages missing. The hint is to look at the page numbers. And those of you who've got 2020 vision will see that we've got page 14, uh, Archimedes, we've got page 16, Gutenberg, and then we've got page 18, Leonardo da Vinci. And between Archimedes and Gutenberg, there is an entire millennium. And as a group of scientists and engineers and others working in STEM subjects, we were aware that the narrative was not a true representation of our disciplines. And so what we did as a group of transdisciplinary scientists, well, what would scientists do? What do you think scientists would do? We drew a graph. And we did a schematic like this. And you can see that there's a 1,000 year gap, a missing millennium. And this is commonly referred to in the past in Northern Europe as the Dark Ages. And it then poses a question, where did modern science come from? Did it really rise from nothing? Were there the Greeks and the Romans, ancient civilizations uh, with dead languages that were used in science and technology, and then all of a sudden, in the Renaissance, we have a rebirth of learning. Of course it didn't rise from nothing. That millennium saw an intense series of activities with a principal axis on the Silk Road linking West Europe, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, India, and China. But in the current social political climate, such cultural amnesia is not just unfortunate, and it's not just an oversight, it can be potentially very dangerous. Because this sort of oversight allows those who espouse corrosive narratives that include fear, hatred, and division to perpetrate that narrative. And this was a call to action, not just as science, scientists, engineers, maths, um, mathematicians, and, and medics, but as part of humanity. And so we worked in cross disciplines. For the first time, I found myself working with historians. And I am not a historian. I keep beating myself like that. I am not a historian. Because I learned so much, as did my colleagues, about historiography, about the social sciences. And it soon became apparent just how diverse these cultures were, with the cultures, ethnicities, and beliefs of these early scientists and engineers. And so, as an organization, FSTC, having gathered information on the diversity and inclusivity of the scientific endeavor in the missing millennium, we set to contextualize this. And 
We thought globally and we acted locally. We went out and we worked with schools, colleges, science clubs, pop-ups in cafes and restaurants, science festivals, public events, and we explained and engaged with our public to highlight the global reach of science and how science is for all and from all and is an inclusive endeavor. And to do this, we had to find role models because every great movement and idea has ideal role models. And just one of very many, and as you can see, there are very many people on this list, was this individual, Al Idrisi, a Moroccan geographer who was advisor to the court of King Roger II of Sicily. And it's a salient point that when he came into the room, the king rose and the entire court rose out of respect for his knowledge and wisdom. And that's a lesson for today's world leaders on how they should regard the scientific and technical advice they receive. We also engaged with national bodies within the UK, such as the British Science Association, the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal Academy of Engineers, and in this case, the Royal Society, Britain's Academy of Science. And here we see the president of the Royal Society, Nobel laureate Sir Paul Nurse, um, hosting the exhibition and book, um, book launch for Arabic Roots. And this was a celebration of the diverse origins of the Royal Society, which to many people in Britain and um, globally seems like a very elite group of um, incredibly intelligent and eminent scientists. But when you look at the origins of the Royal Society, you will find that it is multi-ethnic and is far from um, white and northern and had many people from around the world, particularly um, those who had knowledge of Arabic science. So having acted locally and nationally, we started to go towards a global reach. And one of our um, great heroes was Ibn al-Haythan, uh, uh, also known as al Hazen. And he is um, responsible um, around a thousand years ago for having developed and codified what now is the modern scientific method. He was one of the first people to do that, um, experimentation and refutation of hypotheses. And his groundbreaking work in um, optics led us to propose to UNESCO that he be made and declared the parent of the science of optics. And in 2015, we were delighted to see Al Haytham declared the parent of optical science. And we work with everybody. We work with school children, we work with fellow scientists, we work with policy makers, we even work with politicians. And we continue to engage with individuals throughout the world, including figures from opposing political standpoints. And both these individuals, Condoleezza Wright and Hillary Clinton, got the message loud and clear. And they got the idea that science was for all and from all, and that the dialogue was important in promoting global inclusivity. And one of the people who came to our doors about four or five years ago was um, an individual called Sheikh Mansour. And he said, I'm going to be setting up, I want to set up a NGO. And we worked with him and developed all sorts of possible ways it could look. And he had very clear ideas and we were so pleased to see that. 
And we were there at the birth when um, the organization went through several letters of the alphabet as it settled, before it settled on um, ERF. And so here we are. We have used our skills as practitioners to inform policy, and we are now taking the policy back and feeding it into our practice, thus closing the loop. Thank you very much. <laughs>